afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for coming out to the first installment of our Summer Lunch and Learn Lecture Series. So Sven doesn't realize this, but last fall when I heard you would be leaving, so if you guys don't know, Sven's going to be leaving us soon. Um, that's why I'm in a little depressed state. <laughs> but uh, I started thinking about all the things that Sven knows really well in the facility that I have no idea about. And I thought it'd be great to get him to tell us about them and videotape them so that I always have them with me um, from now on. So Sven's going to do our, our first two lectures. He's going to talk today about uh, live cell imaging and some dynamic analysis that, that, um, and certain techniques that we can take advantage of um, when we're working with live cells. And then uh, in a couple weeks, he's going to talk to us about focus strategies in Zen. So this is something that anyone who's been working with the cell discoverer, the new microscope that came just before Christmas, um, has become aware of how important focus strategies are. Um, and then after Sven takes off, I'm, I'm going to take over, I'm going to talk about super resolution, which is something I, I haven't talked to you, this group about in probably about three years. Um, and then we're going to talk a bit about tissue coloring as well. Uh, as we haven't covered that in a while. So that's what, what's on tap for this summer. Uh, and then we'll, again, do some more um, lunch and learns through the fall uh, as well. So that's good. We'll be coming sometime at the end of the summer. So um, I don't think there's any other big announcements. Uh, again, thanks for coming out. And I'll turn it over to this one. Great, okay, let's start. Welcome everyone. Thanks for coming, especially with this nice weather outside. It's been a very long week, but still you make it here. Too. Thank you. Um, so yeah, today a little bit more about dynamics analysis. Um, as many of you know, uh, if you don't know yet, then I will tell you that now I'm officially originally coming from Belgium. Belgium known for uh, its football, so that's actually the reason why I'm going back. I really miss our leagues being played there. Uh, actually, sorry, I just said soccer. Football is the faith in my um, So yeah, we, we, we're really big fans of, of uh, soccer. And I want to start off with this as an example of, of what are dynamics. So if I make a time lapse, and, and here I have a time lapse of four or five images, you see all the players on the field, you see the blue guys, the dark blue guys, you see the white guy, uh, you see the, the yellow one, the referee, and then you see the goalkeeper in blue on the right side. Now, imagine that there are molecules moving and that the ball would be like a small vesicle. You can hardly see the ball somewhere there, up, up here, somewhere. And actually the purpose is that the blue guys are going to hit the ball going towards the goal. Now, based on that position of the face and based on the position of the legs, you can imagine that most of the people on the field are moving to the right side. You're not 100% sure, but you just deduct that information from the image. Now, here is one on the left side who's kind of a little bit afraid of all the people gathering together and he's running away, while then we have the goalkeeper also moving towards the crowd. Now, in the next shot, you can actually see that, that lots of them have moved forward uh, drastically and, and someone probably also kicked the ball and now suddenly we can actually see this small vesicle there. And again, based on the position of the face and the feet, we can deduct that they are moving towards the goal. The ball, on the other hand, we don't know. I mean, it can go really, can go anywhere. In this photo, we have absolutely no clue where this ball might be going. We can deduct again, knowing that probably the ball was kicked by the people and it's going towards the goal. But still, we don't know whether it will end up in the goal or right or left of the goal. So if you then take the next snapshot, only a couple of almost milliseconds further away, um, you will soon see what's happened. I was running a little too fast here. Now also keep in mind, we know more or less that the speed, sprint speed of a person on average would be like 26, 28 miles per hour. A ball that is being kicked would move at like 67 miles per hour. It's almost three times as fast. So if you look at this image and you know these speeds, what do you think? Is the ball going to be in the goal before the people would be there? Yes or no? I think everyone agrees that that's most probable. Now, the next snapshot, you see that one of the players actually caught up with the ball. 
And still we cannot deduct where the ball is going. Is he going to be able to kick it out of the goal before it actually goes in? Or is he is the ball still faster than the player and going in the goal? But it does seem that based on the position of the player and the ball, something must have happened to the ball that slowed it down. We have no idea what. Could be gravity suddenly changing, who knows? Could be uh, bumping, could be lots of wind force playing onto the ball, but somehow the ball must be slower than what we had initially thought. And the player probably kept the same speed. Now in the next time point, we can actually see that not the ball ended up in the goal, but the player. So, what happened there? We have no idea. We have a very fast time lapse that we acquired. We can do some tracking on it, but still we don't know what happened in the time points in between. And what I want to mean with this is even if we measure like every 10 milliseconds, something might be happening in between that you're definitely missing. If you then look at the real game, it's actually it's a save, and it kicks it again, saves it again, kicks it again, and saves it again. And this is all happening in like four or five seconds. It's a very fast time lapse. So you see that with my five images, I actually covered like one frame a second. Could be faster on a microscope, of course, but we lose a lot of information. We don't know what's actually going on. So now, to look at dynamics themselves, we can go over FRAP, fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching. We can look at FRAP, first resonance, energy transfer. Photo activation can be used, conversion switching, where we actually change a dye in color as soon as something happens. We can use stereometric dyes to measure calcium concentrations, calcium release, calcium binding. Or we can just apply a very fast time lapse, and we can do object tracking, whether in 2D or 3D, to follow those molecules of interest. But FRAP, for example, FRAP will bleaching part of your cell. So you're locally also creating quite some heat. So you don't know what's actually ongoing with all of the other molecules, which are not fluorescently stained, but are also contributing to your life cycle of the cell. Uh, FRAP by itself is not a very obvious or very easy to perform application either. Ratiometric dyes, photo activation could be a little bit easier. Object tracking, as I've just shown, we could miss lots of information. So today, I actually want to focus a little bit more on FCS and RICS, which is fluorescence correlation spectroscopy and raster image correlation spectroscopy. Those two methods can actually detect really fast or slow dynamics in your cell um, with our confocal microscopes that we have in the facility. Now, when you look at FCS, fluorescence correlation spectroscopy, what's important there is to know that we're going to use a point scan. When you look at a confocal microscope, we don't take a snapshot as we do with a camera. We actually build up our image pixel by pixel. We illuminate our sample with a very small volume. And we move the volume over the sample, and, we, and that way we detect we build up our pixels of our image, one pixel at a time, one after the other. Now, to do that, as I just mentioned, we actually have a very small volume that we look at because we use a pinhole to extract or to reduce the, the out of focus light, and we also make optical sections. Now this pensively small pinhole, this small object that we illuminate our sample with is called point spread function. And this point spread function can be calculated. You can know how big it is in X, Y, and Z. And as such, we can just also calculate the volume. So basically, per pixel that we acquire, we are illuminating a very, very small volume, typically somewhere in femtoliter range. Now, as I just mentioned, if an image, a confocal image, you can see it as one of those 60s dance floors. So you have, you have all the tiles on the dance floor, and we build up green, red, green, red, one after the other. We build up the whole image. And you have the people dancing around on the dance floor. Those are then the molecules. Now, what we will do with, for FCS is we're not going to move our laser beam over the sample. We're going to park our laser beam and we're going to illuminate only one small, small tile, actually the PSL. 
And now we're going to look how the molecules are dancing or moving through this laser beam, through this point spread function. And every time a molecule is passing through, it will, it will be excited by the laser beam and it will emit light. And we can detect now this intensity peak. This is something that goes very fast, but we can also detect this very fast, really in, in, in nanosecond basically, range. So much faster than what we would be able to do with a time lapse with the camera, for example, where you are more in millisecond range. So while we are il illuminating those molecules, moving through that small PSF, every time a peak is detected, the moment a molecule goes in the volume, it will start emitting light. When it goes out, it will stop emitting light. So what we're going to do is we're going to measure the time it takes from start to stop emitting. And we're also going to measure the intensity. Was it one molecule? Were the two molecules? Were the molecules bound to each other? And as such, were they offering or, or bringing a much higher emission? Is the intensity higher? Now, FCS you can divide in two parts. One is you can look at the acquisition of FCS, which is quite big all the possibilities you can how to require SCS data. You see the circle for the analysis of the interpretation of SCS is even larger. Now I'm going to focus a little bit here on the center, in the overlap. Because with FCS you can go really very, very far and very deep, especially mathematical thinking by physics. You can detect chemical changes of your molecule. Um, we are going to focus more on the biological dynamics. How fast are the molecules moving in my cell? So as I mentioned before, FCS will use an illumination spot, a small PSF, uh, of which we know the volume. And we're just going to count how many molecules are passing through it in a certain time frame. And we're going to record their intensity at the time they're passing through it. And as such, FCS can be used to calculate the concentration if we know 10 molecules are passing through a certain femtometer volume, we can calculate the nanomolar or the millimolar concentration of it. We can look at mobility, we can look at co-localization. When two molecules are binding, probably they will be moving a little bit slower than with a normal or smaller. We can do some uh, enzyme kinetics, we can look at binding, etc. etc. So this can go really far and can be really helpful for faster dynamics detection. Now FCS may sound very complicated and I hope to bring today a little bit of enlightenment in that part because it's rather mathematical. Um, but what we do is, as I mentioned before, we're going to record the intensity changes every time a molecule is passing through this object. So here, for example, we have one molecule and another molecule coming in, and that's coming out next, maybe these are two going together, coming in, higher intensity, going out, and so on and so on. So the y-axis is the intensity, the x-axis is your time, which you're going to record. From this curve, we can then have the correlation curve. Correlation curve where the slope will tell us the speed of the molecules moving through that volume. Or we can deduct from that the diffusion coefficient. Now, how are we going to do that? Um, what's actually important is if we have two functions, how do they correlate with each other? So I have a function f of x and I have one of h of x. How do they correlate with each other? Meaning every time a molecule in green would come in, do, does it correlate with, for example, the black one in terms of when the intensity goes up for one, does it goes up for the other? When it drops out for one, does it also drop out for the other? That's the correlation spectroscopy part. And we're going to calculate this correlation by first dividing each of the, or normalizing each of the functions by the mean. before it moves. So this is what happens when you divide each function by their mean. 
And then we're going to calculate the products and the integral of the result. Now, if two functions are correlating with each other, we might not see immediately if they just correlate. We're going to detect the area under the curve and compare it with each other. So we take the total of these two and then we make an average. Now, if you make an average of this, there might not be any correlation. It would be one. But if you make a product, you will see that the area and the peak going higher will be always larger than the area below here. And it's exactly that product that shows you a number or that will give you a number that's higher than one. So if you have a result, a correlation that's higher than one, it means that you have a perfect correlation ongoing. If the result or the, the total of the area under one peak and one valley is actually ending in one, so if the average is one, it means there is no correlation now going. So that you can see in the next image. Here, for example, you see one peak is going up while the other one is going down, going up while the other one is going down. If you then calculate the products, these will annihilate each other. You will end up with a correlation of one, meaning there is no correlation between the curves. It's a little bit you somehow could compare it to a destructive interference. One curve will destroy the other one, in a way. So now, once we have this calculated, the question is, how do we come to those two curves? Because we only have one GFP molecule moving around in my cell. Well, we have hundreds with only GFP, we don't have two colors, so we only have one curve. Well, we're going to correlate the curve with itself. So basically what we will do is we take f of x and we take a copy of f of, f of x and we correlate it totally with itself. And the first correlation at time point zero, that's your G0, that's where the correlation starts. And this G0 will also tell you something about the concentration. I'll come back to that afterwards. In the next step, we take our f of x copy, and we're going to shift it a little bit in time, small time bit, and we're going to correlate this new shifted curve with the original position. And we're going to calculate basically our G1, which is our next and you will see that the product is now getting smaller. And on the other curve, the correlation curve, it will also go down. And then we repeat this. And again, our product is smaller. And we also see here the curve being built up is going down again. And we keep on moving this further and further until we don't have correlation anymore. So we go here closer and closer to 1. We will never really reach one. It's, it's a, in mathematics, it's a limit to one. But you will see that curve is going down and then slowly losing its memory and going towards one. It's this curve here that we can now use to calculate our diffusion coefficient. Why? We know the volume of our illumination spot. We know our G0, which is um, inverse, is, uh, well, the G0 is related to 1 over n, the number of particles. So if we know the number of particles and we know the volume, we can calculate the concentration. And we know the time, the detail here, so we can calculate our diffusion coefficient from it. So the amplitude itself will tell us how many molecules do we have in our sample? The de decay time will tell us how fast the molecules are moving, and the long tail here, the long time points, will tell us how the process was complete. Now, this is a qualitative interpretation of the autocorrelation curve, so just for one die. A quantitative interpretation is a little, can be a little more complicated there. 
Now, autocorrelation is only if you have one die. Of course, you can also do it with two dice. You can check whether, for example, GMP and M Cherry are interfering with each other. Are they bound to the same molecule? Then they should correlate perfectly with each other. Are they not bound, or are, are they? Is there some enzymatic reaction ongoing where they are split? This is information you can extract from this correlation curve. Now, as an example for this um, intensity and then this number one, no correlation or higher than one, we have high correlation and then the concentration. If we have 10 molecules with one brightness unit, the average will be 10. If we have 1,000, our average will be 1,000. Now, if we fill them in in our formula here, we can say that in case A, with 10 molecules, we will end up with a value, a correlation value of 1.1. With 1,000 many molecules, we will end up with a correlation of 1.001. So the lower, the closer you go to the 1, it means the higher your concentration is of your dye or your molecule of interest in your sum. Now, what's very important here in, in this text is actually the word perhaps. Nothing is really defined or written in stone in FCS. And you're also probably not going to use FCS as a standalone method to define something that's ongoing in your stuff. You're also going to use some um, blots or so, some gels to say or to define what can be ongoing with your molecule of interest. Yeah. But FCS can be a very, very supportive method there as well. Now, obtaining FCS was one thing, interpreting FCS is another. Now, why can you use FCS? One, you can look at the diffusive. As the more the curve, the correlation curve is moving to the right, the slower the molecule would be moving. So you can easily compare mm -hmm. two subcompartments with each other, for example, the cytoplasm, and then you go and measure in the nucleus, and you can see that your molecule of interest is moving faster or slower in one or the other. Or it can be interacting with all other molecules in the cytoplasm, but not in the nucleus, and so on. You can also calculate the concentration from it, as I've mentioned before. So the higher the curve, the lower the concentration. The higher the curve starts, sorry, the lower the concentration is. And we can really measure, as I've written here, from a picomolar up until a micromolar level. Then you can also define the type of movement. This will probably need a little bit more deeper understanding of your molecule. You cannot just extract it from the curve. But for example, we could be looking at active transport or membrane movement. Membrane movement is typically very, very slow as compared to something floating in your cytoplasm. Now, as I've mentioned, FCS can go very far. And these two slides that are now coming is just to scare me a little bit, but not too much, I hope. As well. So lots of information can be uh, deducted from the formulas. So we can also look at anomalous behavior, we can look at binding triplet states, uh, free movement, and so on. Rotation of the molecule. And there are many algorithms available. Now we don't have to make it too complicated either. Many of these formulas are really to look at the behavior of your molecule in kind of a chemical biochemical way. If you just want to look at the diffusion and you want to see whether the two cell types diffusion has been slowing down or actually speeding up, um, or you want to calculate the concentration, that's a little bit more straightforward than what we're seeing. Now, for as an example here, you see those two curves. Well, where the green line here definitely shows that a molecule with interest is moving faster than on the second cell that has been measured where it has been shifted to the right. 
So this kind of information can be easily deducted from your FCS experiment. Now there's a couple of pitfalls in, in FCS that you have to keep in mind. Um, if the correlation curve, for example, wiggles, if you see the tail going up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down again, it might mean that there is some vibration ongoing on the microscope. So it's also a very good way to measure if something is wrong with your microscope, FCS. Um, maybe the table is not floating anymore and you're capturing vibrations from a nearby fridge. Um, or someone forgot to switch off the lights. The lights are flickering. Those can be detected through FCS as well. So always switch off the lights for FCS. Um, especially for APDs, but can also happen on other detectors. There is some after pulsing um, possible for the detector itself. It's kind of a detected noise. Your G0 can be too low. If your G0 is like 1, 1.001, you're probably measuring in a cell that's a little bit too bright or too many molecules in there, go to a cell that's stayed weaker. So for us, yes. Rather than for imaging, where we will always look for the nice, bright cell to actually publish, in FCS, you would rather look for those that are poorly stained and have a little bit weaker staining, so you can have a, high, a higher G0 or a lower concentration of the bad. A too noisy G0. So when you see that the correlation curve starts with lots of vibrations going up and down and up and down before it, you actually see the decay, this might indicate some noise ongoing in the detectors as well. Or you've just been not doing enough measurements, but too long measurements. So rather than doing five measurements for 20 seconds, you would then be better off by doing 10 measurements for 10 seconds. So you can average the noise out as well. And then using too much power, the photophysics of the molecules can actually introduce uh, for example, bleaching can introduce triplet states easier, so you also don't want to put the laser power too high. You want to keep it low. Now, from FCS, we can go a step further. What's the disadvantage of FCS in a way is that you only measure at one position in the cell at a time. I'm going to do 10, 100 measurements in the cytoplasm. Then I'm going to do 10 or 100 measurements in the windows. Then I'm going to do another cell, another cell. With RIGS, raster image correlation spectroscopy will change this a little bit. What is RIGS about? And RIGS is built upon X, image correlation spectroscopy. Now, instead of looking at intensity fluctuations over time, why don't you look at intensity fluctuations in space? It's exactly the same, it's one variable that changes. Time becomes the position, x, y position. So I mean, if you go to compare the situation of one pixel, or the intensity of one pixel, with the intensity of another pixel, and from that, we can also build up our correlation curve. Now this is just for one image, one time point, for example, on a camera image. So while its image correlation spectroscopy is comparing in space, not in time, we can also now require the time lapse. And from the time lapse, we can calculate for each time point the x and then compare each time point with itself, ending up in sticks, <laughs> which is spatial time for the world. And here you actually see how an X image can look like once we start correlating one pixel with all of the other pixels. That means if you have an image of 100 by 100 pixels, you actually have 10,000 measurements. Because you compare 100 pixels with 100 pixels. Now in the same uh, as in SDS can be extracted from that, you're going to calculate the correlation curve. But there's one problem. We don't know the movement, because movement is something that happens in time. But before we go further in that, how do we build up the coronogram of something in space? Because in time, it's a one-dimensional curve. Now in space, we have x and y coordinates. 
So imagine this image that we're going to correlate with itself. So we have here eight molecules of interest or eight objects of interest. We're going to correlate it with itself. If you put the image, a copy of the image on top of the image and you look at the correlation, you have a perfect correlation at all. If you shift it quite a bit, there's no correlation whatsoever anymore because the intensity is below. There's nothing ongoing. So those are here outside. And what you do is you record the shift and the position of the shift, x and y and the angle. And now you correlate to every other shift possible on that image, so that you really compare every pixel with every other pixel. And slowly, you build up your correlogram. If you shift it just a little bit, you see it's not perfect correlation anymore, but it's still correlating a little bit. Shift it further, a little bit less, it's still correlating. Then we have, a, again, higher correlation, and then lower again, and we go back to no correlation. And as such, when you now shift the image in all of the directions, you can build up your correlogram. And this correlogram also has a lot of information in it. But how do we calculate now our movement, our diffusion of the stars? Well, the nice thing about a point scanner is that you don't take a snap as a camera. You build up your image pixel by pixel. So basically, every pixel in your image is different in space and in time. So your confocal image is actually a small time lapse on its own, if you can think about it. So instead of now only looking at the correlation in space, we're going to combine, we're going to look at the correlation in space and in time on this one image. And we're also going to build up our correlogram as such. And if I have no movement at all, or very slow movement, this is how a correlogram would look like. But if my movement increases, my correlogram will also change. Faster movement will end up in a more squeezed correlogram. Now, in the formula, as I mentioned, we not only look at the space factor, but we also look at the time factor. And they are connected via the diffusion. So from one image that we acquire, we can now immediately know our diffusion coefficients or <coughs> molecular speed, pixel by pixel. Now, if a molecule is moving fast, you will see a fast decay of the correlation in the x direction for a very short distance, or for a long distance, it will actually correlate for a long time. But there will be hardly any y correlation, and that's how your correlogram would look like that. If a molecule is moving slow, you will see a slow decay in correlation in the x direction at short distance, but long in the y direction. And then your correlogram will look like this in that direction. So from your correlogram, you can now also very quickly calculate your G0, which could be your concentration, but you can also calculate your decay. Now, what is it in practice? If I have a molecule moving while I am scanning, if a molecule is moving fast, you see here, I capture it in the next scan, then not, then maybe again, and then not anymore. While if a molecule is moving slow, I capture it, capture it, then not, then I do again and again, and only after a while I will not detect it anymore. And, uh, Correlation curves will also look different. A fast moving molecule going down fast with a long tail, or a slow moving molecule going down slower than the other one but with a short tail. And also here, my TK curve can be calculated. Now, as an example, um, and what is what's so nice about RIGS is that you can scan a whole image at once. You can divide that image in small sub-parts, and you can calculate the small regions. And you can calculate the diffusion coefficient for that small region, and for this small region and that small region, and immediately compare regions with each other. Whereas with FCS, you would first have to measure only here, 
do all the calculations, and then you would move your point where you are measuring, and then you start measuring there again. So you have to do many more measurements in FCS. While in bricks, you can immediately compare different compartments of the cell with each other. Is it moving really slower at the membrane than in the cytoplasm, than in the nuclear membrane, than in the nucleus? <coughs> Basically, in one in you can extract that information very, very fast. Here's another example, mobility of packs between adhesion structures, and unfortunately this movie doesn't work, because otherwise you would see it moving here. But from this image, you can also then calculate the diffusion coefficient, you can see how fast your molecule is moving, what the concentration is, and you could also calculate the diffusion um, image. And the diffusion image will show you that in the image itself, here the diffusion is higher than to the cytoplasm, especially as compared to the extracellular matrix. So in bricks with one scan, uh, typically we scan 512 by 512, or 1024 by 1024, we have more than 250,000 or even 100 million time points that we can use for our calculations. So from this knowledge in our image, we can now extract the dynamical behavior, similar to what we obtained with FCS. Within one cell, we can immediately compare different compartments with each other. Now, FCS data can just be extracted without needing GASP or, or APD detectors, photon counting enabled detectors, because we just need a point scan. So the, even with the older ones, we could still do it, basically. Now with a resonance scanner, which can scan very, very fast we could image maybe our movement very fast, but then what? We have the image of the vesicles moving very fast, but we would still need to use, for example, object tracking to define the speed of movement. And we don't have any idea of the concentration. So this is where I think RICS and FCS can definitely be a weakness as well. Because you can extract much more information from it. So FRAP and FCS, they're both implemented in Zen. You can always acquire the data. Um, on the offline workstations, you can also do the analysis for the FRAP and the FCS. Similar to FRAP, I should actually add it, I forgot, FRAP is also implemented there. So this, these applications are definitely possible on our system that's CBI. RIGS is also one of them. So you can choose whichever you want to use. The acquisition is always feasible on our systems. Analysis would be done on our workstations because that needs some additional um, modules of the Zen software. We can measure rates of microsecond to millisecond uh, time scale movement. Also, this is very important, we can measure from the, the dynamics range from 0.2 to 200 square microsecond, micrometer per second is actually very slow up until very fast movement. Immobile or very slow moving structures can be removed in the RIG software as well. This is only possible if you actually acquire the time lapse, because then you make an average and you see over time slowly moving or immobile structures will be averaged out and taken away. Now, I mentioned this before, RIGS can be done with any point scanning or focal microscope. Except for some technical reasons, the other ZEM 700 would not be able to do that. So keep that in mind. FCS, on the other hand, does require GASP detectors because it needs photon counting. And with this, I would like to conclude the talk. We'd we'll be happy to ask any questions. Yeah. Or, of course, we can always meet they come at the CDI.
require images with a few different scan views to find out what's kind of possible? Yeah, you have to search a little bit. I always start with the average scan speed. 8 to 16 microseconds for the reason. And then I would put it to go, that's more so than me. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and then I would have to look at the color of the other There's some, some conditions that you have to keep in mind. So the pixel size is So if you want to look at cross correlations of two dyes, you want to choose dyes that are far apart from each other. I don't show bleed to one in color because that was the theory of the measure. Does line and color I missed it? But is there any limitation to the concentration of your molecule of interest? So is there too high a concentration that would make this imaging impossible? If you play football with 10,000 balls, would be a hard game to watch. Right, so yes, the answer is yes, there is a higher limit. Um, however, in, in cellular works, the higher limit is way above what you would consider in physiological conditions. So again, either by chance, it just happens that stuff in cells is in the order of maybe 10 molecules per volume, maybe 100 molecules per volume, and this is where we're at, for example. Is that the same for Rix? Yeah. Kind of, Rix needs a little bit more dilution. Um, you cannot, with FCS, it's easy to measure 1,000 molecules per, per volume. With Rix, you would need like 10. Is there a requirement for the blindness of the high values or the brightness for because a lot of the photos are really people who are really fast? Yeah, for the uh, for FCS you want to have actually something that's not too light line line, so you want to stay lower and so you can also keep the laser color low as well. Uh, as long as you can detect it, what you see. You will also, FCS is also a good way to, to look at the like, um, uh, bleaching of the world. So you will see if you can reduce it from the other so that's a good way. But typically, laser powers are so low, and the system does more than sensitive enough so that you 